Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to my guide to the Orbone Monastery 24-man raid in Final Fantasy XIV. To enter, you must have completed the previous quests and 24-man raids as part of the Return to Evilly storyline in Kugane. Once per week, you may win one piece of item level 390 armor from this raid, this limit will be lifted sometime in the future, as well as receiving a Melande's coin from your final boss kill for the first time that week. You can exchange this along with a Galgan and Rabinastrin coin from the previous 24 mans in the Return to Evilly series to Eskina in Rolgar's Reach to buy upgrade materials for Tomestone of Genesis armor. This instance is broken up into four bosses with some trash in between. To skip to a specific boss, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. Upon entering the dungeon, you'll just need to kill a few mobs before the first boss. There's nothing you really need to worry about here, you know, other than maybe being a healer and having the second set of adds just bolt right for you. Regens are scary sometimes. Anyways, dodge AoEs and you're fine here. Let's talk about boss number one. The first boss is Mustadio. Of course, he has a room-wide AoE called Energy Burst and a tank buster called Arm Shot. Those two things are standard. He also uses two 240-degree cones called Left and Right Handgun. Left Handgun will hit in a 240-degree AoE to his left and his front, while Right Handgun goes to the right and the front. He often uses these back to back, but regardless, if you just try to stay right behind him as often as possible, you can have time to dodge them pretty easily. Mustadio's main mechanic is maintenance. When he casts this, he will tether to several robots around the arena, whether it be the constructs along the outside or any of the four turrets around the inside of the arena. If he tethers to the constructs, they will perform a line AoE across the arena from their current location. If he tethers to the turrets, they will hit one fourth of the arena around them. Early on, he only tethers to the Constructs, or the turrets separately, but towards the second half of the fight, he'll begin tethering to four Constructs and two turrets all at the same time. Pay attention to which robots are woken up and stand in any zone that doesn't intersect with any of their AoEs. The only other attack you should see in Phase 1 is him firing several tracking AoEs towards random Alliance members. These players just run away from the tracking AoE, and other players, and it's fine. After a bit of time passes, he'll show you his other major mechanic, Analysis and Last Testament. The first time Analysis comes out, you'll be stunned and get a short cutscene showing Mustadio preparing to fire his rifle. You'll also receive three markers around your character. The goal here is to make sure that the side of your character with no markers is the side that's hit by Last Testament. If it hits any of the weak points he has marked around your body, you're dead. Look for where he jumps up to and face the open side of the circle towards him. Also, be sure to be topped up, it still hurts pretty bad. The second half of the fight he gets a few new tricks, but nothing major. Legshot places several mines on the ground that players should avoid stepping on, and Ballistic Missile fires several AoEs on players that should spread out. The confusion sometimes sets in when he does these mechanics along with left or right handgun, which you also need to be avoiding. Other than that, just keep an eye out for the more difficult maintenance patterns later in the fight, and any analysis plus last testament combos that he uses again. Simple enough, let's move on. There's no trash between Mustadio and the second boss, so let's talk about boss number two, Agrius. Room-wide AoE for this one is Divine Light, Tank Buster is Thunder Slash. Thunder Slash is also a very large cleave, so keep it faced away from everyone. She also likes to use Cleansing Flame to place AoEs on several players who should spread away from each other. Agrius's main mechanics are Sword and Shield Bearer. She summons circles around the arena that, when stepped in by the player, grant the user a duty action. If the player steps into the Holy Shield, they will get a one-time use shield that blocks attacks from sword-bearing enemies. If the player steps into the Heavenly Sword, you will be given a spammable duty action that can be used to destroy any barriers or enemies with shields around them. This sword hits in a small cone in front of the player, so get close and line yourself up with your target. Early in the fight, Agrius will use Judgment Blade, which must be blocked with the Holy Shield duty action. This action is channeled and only blocks in front of the player, so when you go to use it, ensure that you don't move or use any other actions, and also ensure you are facing Agrius herself, or it won't work. She likes to use Divine Light after this, so if anyone failed to block the attack, make sure to heal them quick if they survived. The next main mechanic is Cleansing Strike. When she does this, one full alliance will be stunned and pulled into the Shadow Realm. Your goal here is to defeat all of the ghosts before your Doom debuffs wear off and kill you. You also need to keep these ghosts from reaching the center of the room or finishing any abilities they might be casting, as this deals damage to the players and if you die you'll just be ejected from the area. DPS should focus down the Tainted Ghosts, who gradually float towards the middle of the arena, exploding for damage if they reach that little shadowy pillar there. Healers and or tanks should grab the Heavenly Sword duty action that's in there and use it against any Taintless Souls, which will cast a deadly spell unless they are killed using this action. 
Once you've killed all the ghosts, and as long as you killed them before the Doom War off, you'll be ejected back into the normal fight. While players are in the Shadow Realm, Agrius will also use Consecration on one of the two remaining alliances outside, scattering them around the arena and trapping them in barriers. Several adds will also appear and ready line AoEs aimed at these players. The remaining untrapped players must grab the Heavenly Sword and use it to free the trapped players so everyone can avoid the AoEs. Next, she'll use Hollowed Bolt, which marks two players. When the marker expires, it does either a Donut AoE, followed by an AoE inside the Donut, or it does it the other way around. Most of the time, expect parties to just YOLO this. Ideally, it's best if both marked players stack together and go to a set location, like the back of the room or even dead center, but I expect this to literally never happen to the Duty Finder, so good luck. Next is Agrius' ad phase. While she charges her Holy Blade, she will summon two Holy Shield Circles and, later on, two Heavenly Sword Circles. The party must defeat two Sword Knights and one Shield Knight using these duty actions before her Holy Blade finishes charging. Have one alliance, each take one knight. A and C can take Sword Knights, and B can take the Shield Knight. Alliances dealing with the Sword Knights should drag them away from the Shield Knight party and each other, closer towards the sides of the arena. When the Sword Knight uses its large point-blank AoE, use the Holy Shield action to block it if you're in the alliances that are dealing with them. It can be outranged, but you don't need to do that. The Holy Shield is there specifically to counter this attack. The same rules apply as before. Face the Knight and don't move or act while channeling. The Shield Knight party is fine if they're out of range of these AoEs, but in the Duty Finder, I'm not going to lie, I like to just grab the Shield even if I'm in the Shield Knight Alliance, just in case A and C don't move their mobs far enough away. No trust. Anyway, once Agrius gives you the two Heavenly Sword Circles, the Alliance on the Shield Knight should grab them and use them on the various emblazoned shields that spawn that protect the Knight. Once that's done, you can go back to finishing off the Shield Knight, kill all three Knights, and survive Agrius's Heavenly Judgment. For the second half of the fight, you'll see more of the various mechanics in Phase 1, including another Consecration and potentially another Shadow Realm phase. There will now also be tethers that spawn on players which must be blocked using a Holy Shield. They shoot line AoEs at the tethered targets, so have them grab shields and stay slightly apart from each other on the shield sides of the arena while everyone else stays away from them. There's no reason for everybody to go and stand in these line AoEs. If you happen to be caught in the path with the tether AoEs, you can grab a shield and block it yourself. Other than that, there isn't really much new with the second half, so just keep using the duty actions and you're set. Before boss number 3 is the final set of trash for the dungeon. The first three mobs you'll fight are Night Stalkers who do very little to oppose the party, so just AoE them down. Then the big Dark Crusader ad does a lot of room-wide AoEs, line AoEs, and a familiar mechanic from Google Library. You probably remember it, but in case you don't, several seals appear around the arena and must be locked by having the number of players matching the symbol stand on them at the same time. So three circles means three players, etc, etc. Just go to the nearest symbol and wait for enough players to come by and finish the lock. Once one is locked, you can look around to help other players lock other seals. You don't need to stand on it the whole time. In Google failing this summoned adds, so while I've never failed any of the locks in this instance, I'm assuming this would do the same. Dispatch the Dark Crusader and move on to the third boss, Thunder God Sid. For this boss, you're going to probably want to be pretty patient with the Duty Finder. There's going to be a lot of wipes, especially considering it's only been a couple of days as of this guide, so please be patient with your fellow man. I do expect the Duty Finder to go back and forth on a couple of strategies. What matters the most here is everyone agrees to use the same strategy, whichever one you go with. I personally preferred to put the alliance markers down between the circles at the northwest, northeast, and south sides of the room, and I'll explain why as we get to various mechanics. Thunder God himself will auto-attack all three tanks in the alliances every swing, so ensure to keep them alive unless you want to eat them yourself. Right at the start, he will use Cleansing Strike and reduce the entire raid's HP down to 1, and inflict Doom on everyone. Heal everyone up to full to get rid of the Doom, so stay stacked at the beginning and don't run off in the middle of nowhere where you won't get heals. The first big mechanic here is Thunder God Holy Sword, or TG Holy Sword as it's called in the game. This attack will hit in specific areas of the map depending on what animations Thunder God uses and where. When he lays three swords down in various spots of the arena, he will hit those circles he is aiming for with large AoEs. The AoEs are bigger than the circle he's actually aiming for, so move out into the other circle a little bit extra just to be safe. His other two animations for TG Holy Sword are either a donut or a point-blank AoE. If you see him wind up his swords over his back, he is going to do a point-blank AoE, so get towards the back of any of the circles around the arena. If he sticks them in the arena itself, it becomes a donut AoE, so get inside of his hitbox. Pay careful attention to these, as this is among the easiest mechanics he does, and you don't want to get hit by these. 
Next, Sid marks three players with giant red circles called Shadow Blades. These will hit any players inside very hard and drop a growing orb of death at its impact point. These circles grow and harm any players caught inside of them. Additionally, if two overlap or even touch slightly, they explode on the raid, inflicting a stacking bleed that deals moderate damage as well. You want to avoid that. To deal with this, each alliance should assign two circles that belong to that alliance, and ensure that there is never more than one orb per circle on the arena. Marked players should bring this AoE marker to the back center of whatever circle they are in, as it does grow quite large and can consume the entire circle if placed dead center. Do not go off to the left or right. You are trying to avoid these circles overlapping. Just go directly to the back of the circle. This is where strategies may vary. Like I said earlier, I prefer to place Alliance A, B, and C markers between two circles. Then you just claim the circles to your left and your right for Shadow Blades. Easy. Some alliances use what is called Ozma Strat, replicating a strategy similar to one used against the Ozma boss in the Weeping City of Mott. This has alliances tank in the circles themselves, and the two drop points for these markers are immediately to the back of the circle you're in, and the one to the alliance's left. I dislike the strategy because of the running distance for the player has to go to the back left, and also the fact that being between two circles is advantageous for the Thunder God Holy Sword and another mechanic later on. You know what, it doesn't really matter though, if everyone's on board and everyone does it right, that's all that matters. Next is a tank mechanic, Crush Helm. Thunder God will hit the tank four times back to back with an attack that increases their damage taken up to four stacks, before they are hit with Crush Helm itself as a massive tank buster. You can usually ignore that cleansable debuff and just mitigate slash heal the hit, but do feel free to assume the ability and this will probably be one of the few points you really want to use tank and bone skills. Next up is Duskblade, a roomwide AoE that is lethal if players don't activate the six platforms around the arena. Each platform requires three players, and in the Duty Finder, I mostly see people YOLO panic try to fill them all. Assuming an alliance is completely alive, you can send your tank and two healers to one of them, and your DPS to the other, and it should be fine. The three and five splits good as long as there's at least three people in each of them. If players are dead, try to keep your wits about you and cover for the nearby circles. Also, the circles you'll be responsible for are the same circles you would use for Shadow Blade assignments, so use that as you will. Also, make sure you're topped, because even with everyone in circles, this stuff still hits pretty hard. Next up is Crush Weapon. This will place a marker on a random player from each alliance the tank can be targeted, dropping an AoE under them when the marker disappears. This AoE will then track them four times in a row, chasing them to wherever their current location is. You basically place the AoE down and then keep running away from it until the fourth strike is finished. Once you've seen Crushed Weapon, Thunder God will shoot you to a different platform and begin his ad phase. Another reason to do the ABC markers the way I do them on the original platform is that it aligns with where each ad will spawn in this phase too. Each alliance takes their own ad and kills it. They use hollowed bolt like Agrius does, though each alliance gets their own hollowed bolt and each bolt does either the donut or the middle circle AoE randomly. It'll do one of those first and then do the opposite, but not all three of them will be the same. I personally prefer to just bring this marker about 45 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise from my current ad. Everyone in the raid should agree on this direction to bait it, otherwise it can get a little tight. This allows your AoEs to not at all interfere with one another, and make it so that other players near your ad won't have to move much to dodge the second AoE after the first one goes off. During the first Hollowed Bolt, each ad will put a split damage marker on a random player. Dodge the AoEs from the Hollowed Bolt, but stay near each other to make sure you can split these AoEs. There's enough time after the Hollowed Bolt AoEs disappear for you to just basically run under the boss regardless of positioning, as long as you're not all the way in the middle of nowhere. Try to mitigate them, because they do hit pretty hard. The second Hollowed Bolt, a player will be marked and tethered to the ad. This player should face their marker away from the party towards the wall, as it fires a huge line AoE at that target, and it's just unnecessary damage if it hits anyone else. If they do a third Hollowed Bolt, it'll just replicate what he did for Bolt number one. Kill all three adds while doing this before the Swordplay Gauge fills to enter the second half of the fight. The second half does a lot of what the first half of the fight did, but more of it. The boss can do his Thunder God Holy Swords in new orders, and also has a new Holy Sword where he slams down one at a time over three circles in the arena, so get the hell out of dodge when you see him line them up one at a time. Crush Weapon and Crush Helm are the same here, but he can do them at the same time, and Crush Weapon can target the tank during this as well, so make sure they don't get hit by that while they're also cooled down in Crushed Helm. He will use Cleansing Strike still, though he often uses it closer to other mechanics to make a bit more pressure on healing up. Just be sure to stack near your Alliance Marker when you see it coming for heals. 
His next new mechanic is Crush Armor. This places a tether on each alliance's tank. It will then perform four consecutive hits, each of which will inflict physical vulnerability up. You'll want any party member to step in front of the tank and take this tether off of them, as this will cause the boss's auto attacks to hit insanely hard for the duration of that physical vuln up. You can use things like Palo to eat a few hits, but it won't last the entire duration, so better to just have the DPS and the healers pass it off every time someone gets hit. As long as no one is hit twice in a row, they won't die. After Crush Armor, Sid will once again use the Shadow Blade Circles, but this time it will target two players in each alliance for six total. Luckily, you have six circles around the arena, and we assigned each alliance two of them. So if each alliance bring their two AoEs to the back of their two circles, and there should be no issue. Remember, direct, back, and centered. Do not go off to the side, please. Just after those circles resolve, whether it be right or wrong, Dusk Blade occurs again, so at least three people into every circle. Right after Dusk Blade, all six circles around the arena will be hit by a donut AoE, and three of those circles will have Ice Wolf adds inside of them. Players should dodge to the nearest circle with an Ice Wolf add and kill it while staying out of the persistent ice AoE covering the rest of the arena. Every time I've done this fight, the Ice Wolves have been in a perfect triangle, allowing each alliance to be responsible just for the two assigned circles we gave them at the start of the fight. I've heard players say they've encountered two right next to each other, and I even had someone say they got three right next to each other, which seems absurd to react to, but if that can happen, I just say look for the closest one and bolt to it. There's not really much you can do about that. However, I've only ever seen the triangle format, so what do you know? After this, the fight just repeats, so perform all these mechanics as they occur again until the Thunder God is put down. Right after the Thunder God, the party will walk into the boss room for the final boss, Ultima the High Seraph. This fight is split into two halves, and you'll get a checkpoint after the first part. I'll put timestamps for the second half in the description. For the most part, Phase 1 is very straightforward. Avoid AoEs and spread out with AoE markers, mostly. Aura Light can be a bit annoying. It summons walls of ice with line AoEs, and you'll need to dodge the AoEs that you get and spread away from each other in a more confined space. The main thing Ultima does here is summon Demi Lukavi in the forms of Famfrit, Belias, and Hashmal. Famfrit summons his Dark Ewers to summon Water Twisters that move across the arena. Standing in them hurts, so try not to. Belias summons his Clock AoEs with the fast spinning Clock AoEs exploding first and the slow ones exploding second. So stand on the slow ones, then move into the fast ones. Hashmal summons towers that he topples over, killing any players caught in the impact of wherever they fall. Ultima will also use things like Aura Light and Ground AoEs while you are dodging these early on. Ultima will also introduce you to Grand Cross, an attack that summons three Aura Sight shards around the room. These pillars will shoot line AoEs in the four cardinal directions from its current location. With all three on the map, only one square of the arena is safe from being hit by any of them. So watch them as they fall and try to get to one area not overlapped with potential AoEs. She also uses Flare 4 as a proximity AoE on the tanks, so they should run away from the raid members and each other. When damaged enough, Ultima will go into Trio mode, using Hashmal, Belias, and Fanfrict attacks all at once. First, Hashmal uses a proximity AoE Earth Hammer, which players should get away from. Belias uses his Clock AoEs, and Fanfrit summons the Dark Ewers. Fanfrit then starts using Dark Cannonade, marking each alliance one at a time with these red down arrows. These mean you must stack on other players with the same marker, so just run to the nearest alliance member that has one of these markers and stand on top of them. Belias will shortly after place red nail markers on players, which will summon AoEs that pursue them for several explosions. Finally, Hashmal will do a dive bomb that covers half the arena, so identify his location and stay away from him. After you dodge all these AoEs, the three of them will disappear and a barrier will form to protect you against Ultima's ultimate illusion attack. Stand in the barrier and prepare for a heal and a DPS check. Ultimate Illusion ticks for several thousand damage every second, so persistent healing is needed here. The damage does gradually go up as well, eventually going up to 6,000 damage per second, so don't get too cocky. Early on, Ultima will attempt to break the barrier with Ruin Nation while you are taking damage from Ultimate Illusion. This will quickly decrease the strength of your barrier and must be DPS down before the barrier shatters. After this, Ultimate Illusion will briefly stop before returning and quickly ramping up in damage. There's nothing you can do to DPS here, so just spam heals until this is all done. Once you're finished with Ultimate Illusion, you will get a checkpoint and continue the battle against Ultima. If you wipe, you will start from this point next time you fight her. This phase of Ultima has a bunch of AoEs that Ultima will move mid-cast with Eastern or Western March. You must be ready for the adjusted locations of most AoEs. Redemption is her tank buster here, and she doesn't have a traditional roomwide AoE, unlike pretty much every other boss. 
Demi Virgo summons several Dominion NPCs to do a number of different mechanics. The first is a set of line AoE susceptible to the Eastern and Western marches, so just watch where they're going to blow and make sure you're standing in the safe zone, which should be where they're actually coming from. Grand Cross will also appear, but only the first two Orosite shards will be blown in the stated direction. This just means you need to be more careful when finding that singular safe zone. The second Demi Virgo will have six small arrows appear and move slowly in the direction they are pointing. After moving several times, a small circle will appear that you want one player to step in quickly, so six players total, one for each circle. That player will intercept one of the Dominion NPCs, preventing them from dealing raid-wide damage. The player who blocks the attack will also gain a buff that increases the damage they deal for some time. Ideally, your highest DPS players take these, but if it looks like no one's going to grab one, just go grab it just in case. There is a redemption during this, so make sure you watch the tank's health. The last Demi Virgo will summon an ad that uses a hard-hitting attack on a tethered player. One of the off tanks should intercept this and take the hit, while the rest of the players spread the AoEs out and avoid the ground AoEs that she summons as well. There are also traps laid around the arena, and stepping on one or standing near one when it expires will deal damage to the player. They pulse occasionally to remind you where they are, so just stay away from them while dodging everything else. Once you've done the third Demi Virgo, Ultima will retreat and bring everyone to the Shadow Realm again. She will also summon several ice walls to create a maze and knock you towards the back of it. You must run from the back wall to the small circle that's under Ultima's hitbox, all the while being unable to use any skills. She will use that dice move over your head which demands that you stop moving before the counter rolls down to zero. Dominion adds will float by and drop AoEs while Ultima blows the wind to adjust their AoE positions. While all these AoEs are going out, Ultima will summon death zones gradually from your starting point, so you have to do this, get to the front, and do it quickly before you get caught in the death zones. Ultima will also do spread markers and a proximity AoE on the tank throughout all of this. You can use the dark zones to spread these out, you don't have to spread them out inside of the light zone. Just keep in mind you won't be able to use any skills while you're doing this. Once the tank has dealt with the proximity AoE, Ultima will return and continue her barrage of other attacks. While she continues to use the same attacks, the orders, combinations, and frequency of them all has changed drastically. They're all much faster and thus will be much deadlier to the average player. For example, she can use the mines along with the line AoEs and wind at once. She can use the six dominion circles plus the targeting players with AoEs at the same time. This doesn't really change the strategy much, you just don't want to be hit by multiple attacks, same as usual. If you last long enough in this phase, you will have to do another Shadow Realm, but Ultima's health bar is fairly low here, so it's feasible to not cycle that far around again. Just expect a ton more overlapping mechanics and AoEs in this last part, and all should go fine. And that's a wrap for my guide to the Orbone Monastery. Thank you to Gwynpai and Keo, even though I didn't end up using your footage, for submitting footage to help with this guide, specifically for that little phase inside of Agrius's Shadow Realm. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned. We'll have more guides leading up to Shadowbringers, and of course, when Shadowbringers comes out. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one, and until then, take care.